Hello, I'm Dr. John Picton, and in this equity short, I'm talking about Target Holdings Limited and Red Ferns, a case from 1995. It's an equitable compensation case. That means it's a case about the circumstances in which a trustee in breach will or will not be held liable for that breach. The case is also about the building on the screen, very fine arts and crafts building, 60 to 64 Great Hampton Street in Birmingham. A company called Crowngate bought that building. As is normal, when they bought the building, they applied for mortgage loans from another company called Target Holdings. Target Holdings uh, advanced in round numbers 1.7 million. The application to Target Holdings from Crowngate was supported by a valuation. The valuation said that the building was worth two million. That valuation was wrong. You can probably guess what happened. Crown Gate did indeed buy the building. They even paid the mortgage for a short while. But they became insolvent, defaulted, Target took possession, sold the building and only got £500,000. At that point, they realised that they'd made a loss and they sought to recoup that loss. They couldn't take Crowngate to court, it was insolvent. They couldn't take the valuer to court either, that was also insolvent. And so they went after their solicitors, Red Ferns. Red Ferns had actually acted for both Target and Crowngate at the same time. To understand the case that Target thought it had, it's necessary to understand the way that the property was conveyed, how it ended up in Crowngate's hands. Target didn't know about this. The property was originally owned by a company called Mirage, and then it was sold to Panther in quick succession, it was sold to Coley, and then Crowngate, subject to Target's mortgage, that is the charge. A senior partner at Red Ferns, a Mr Bundy, had paid Target's loan monies to Panther. That was a breach. Mr Bundy's job was to pay the monies to Crowngate and secure a charge for Target Holdings, not pay monies to a stranger, that is a third party. But there was a problem for Target Holdings. Although the way that Crowngate acquired title and the charge was applied to the building was not what Target expected. The actual outcome was precisely what was expected. Crowngate became the owner subject to Target's charge. And so on the facts as they were assumed to be by the court, the payment to Panther had not caused the loss. It's assumed in the case that Mirage could have got the money it received from Panther elsewhere, this chain conveyance could have happened anyway, and the outcome would have been precisely the same, even if Mr Bundy at Redferns hadn't paid the money to Panther. Lord Wilkinson says that it's a novel point of law and asks the question, is the trustee liable to compensate the beneficiary not only for losses caused by the breach, but also for losses which the beneficiary would, in any event, have suffered, even if there'd been no such breach? And so Red Ferns accepted that there'd been a breach, but they said the payment to Panther, which was in breach, um, hadn't caused the loss to Crowngate. That was caused by the wrong valuation, not their payment. Target would have been in exactly the same position regardless of their breach. It's interesting, I think, to set this case in a little bit of social context. The overvaluation might never have come to light, and there's an alternative world in which there was never a court case. Presumably, Crowngate never intended to go bust. They did 
uh, pay their mortgage instalments for a short while. In the 90s, remember this case was heard in 1995, and the problems in the case right at the start of the decade, there was an economic downturn and that perhaps accounts for why Crowngate struggled and it certainly accounts for why the value recouped by Target was so low. Imagine that Crowngate had held on to it for a much longer period, well it would be worth a lot more than £500,000 now and in the modern day it would be worth a lot more than £2 million as well. It wasn't a bad investment in the long run. This case is famous for developing, expanding the concept of equitable compensation. Before we get there and to understand precisely what that is, it's useful to compare it with an alternative. That's the duty to account. In the case, Nicholas Patton QC argued for Target that Red Ferns was liable to account and restore, that is, put the account back in the position it would be, regardless of whether or not the breach caused the loss. This is an accounting analogy, and the idea is that the account should be put right. They should be put in the position they would be in if the breach hadn't happened. And this accounting view doesn't pay any attention to whether or not the breach actually caused a loss. The idea is the account should be put right, it doesn't matter whether or not the breach caused the loss. If the House of Lords had framed the case in terms of the duty to account, and that is not paid attention to whether or not the breach had caused the loss, Target would have won the case and Redferns would have had to have paid over the money to Target. But this is not a case which is famous for the duty to account. It's a case which is famous for a concept of equitable compensation. Lord Brown Wilkinson finds the fact that the loss is not caused by the breach is relevant to questions of liability. He frames the nature of liability in terms of equitable compensation. And he says, in what's quite a famous quotation, equitable compensation for breach of trust is designed to achieve exactly what the word compensation suggests, to make good a loss in fact suffered by beneficiaries and which causing hindsight and common sense can be seen to have been caused by the breach. And so the loss has to have been caused by the breach in order for there to be liability. And because the payment to Panther had not caused the loss, at least in the way that the court framed the case, there was no liability. And so Red Ferns won the case and they didn't have to pay any money to Target. The case is interesting for expanding and developing this concept of equitable compensation, but it's often cited for another reason as well. In some comments by Lord Brown Wilkinson, and he gives the leading judgment, he suggests that commercial trusts and the traditional family trust might be in some way different, that different rules might apply to the different types of trust. It's important to note that when a judge gives a leading judgment, as in this case, and all the other judges agree with him or her, then essentially the judges have clubbed together it might be, although it's not apparent from reading the case, that different parts of the judgment are written by different judges. This case then, because all the judges essentially club together, is clearly designed to be a definitive statement on equitable compensation and nudge out the duty to account. What it's not though, is any type of evidence that there is now two different types of trust, a commercial trust, and a family trust. The equitable compensation, it has to be said, is most at home in the commercial context. It reflects shallow market relationships, so the relationship between a mortgage lender and a solicitor. It's not a deep human relationship, and there it makes sense that liability for harms 
must flow well from actual harms caused. Compare that with a family relationship where the trustee might be selected as a family member or a family friend and there perhaps a higher standard of liability might be thought most appropriate. That higher standard of liability would be the duty to account where the trustee has to cough up regardless of whether or not the breach caused the loss. What Lord Brown Wilkinson does in this case is not create two types of trust. He's clear that equitable compensation, the, the standard which does pay attention to whether or not the breach caused the loss, applies to both types of trust. It applies across the board. So rather than create two types of trust, in fact, what he seems to do is colour all trusts with a market standard, with market-based principles.